Hey guys, Dr. A here, and in this brief video, I'm going to introduce you to the world of muscle mechanics. I'll briefly describe how motor units are recruited according to the size principle, and at the sarcomere level, how muscle fibers produce force to contribute to the overall function of a muscle to move our joints, and how we use electromyography or EMG to give us some indication of muscle activation and how the muscles are functioning during human movement. So if you've viewed any of my other videos on biomechanics in general, I've shown this feedback control loop a number of times and it simplifies how our neuromuscular system works in order to what? Move our bones and or our joints. We use our muscles to provide the engines for that joint motion, but their muscles are controlled by the central and peripheral nervous system. So this video concentrate on this part right here, how the Motor, motor neurons um, essentially control muscular contraction in order to create the movements at the joints and stabilize the bones. So the motor unit is the functional unit of movement, of joint movement, and it is made up of a cell body, otherwise known as a motor neuron, as well as an axon, this is through the peripheral nervous system, that terminates at the neuromuscular junctions or end plates, which innervate or interact with the muscle fibers in the individual muscles themselves. So this is one motor unit. So a motor unit could be made up of hundreds or thousands of muscle fibers within a specific muscle. And so one motor unit is uh, the cell body itself, which originates in the ventral root of the spine, mainly if we're talking about skeletal muscle, uh, voluntary contractions, it's made up here in the cervical and the lumbar regions of the spine. This is the ventral root of the spine, this is the axon, and it terminates here at the NMJ, neuromuscular junction of a particular muscle. And this example here is a gastroxoleus muscle and it's made up of hundreds or even thousands of muscle fibers within the muscles themselves. So how are these motor units recruited? Well, we're going to talk about the size principle. And when I say does size matter when, in regards to muscle, we're not, we're not defining size according to bro science here, which is the predominant brand of reasoning and bodybuilding circles that, you know, the more um, resistance you have in working out, that equals greater strength gain. No, that's, we're, you know, bro science is 50% facts and 50% magic, 100% results. We're not talking about that. The size principle in this case is how these motor units are recruited according to the demands that are needed by that muscle. So if you've taken anatomy and phys or mammalian physiology, a lot of the, um, concept that I'm going to talk about re relations to muscle contraction would be review for you. So these are the three basic types of motor units, the S or slow units, followed by the FR, which are fast, um, I should say, resistant or fatigue resistant units, and then the fast fatigable units. And you could see here that the motor units are activated according to the uh, force demands of a particular muscle. So how do we know this? Well, according to earlier research from the 60s, this is Henneman et al., they did uh, in cap muscle a very unique experiment. It's called the stretch reflex, so where they stretched uh, the triceps or muscle and they monitored individual, it's actually two motor units. So the one was a low threshold, slower motor unit, and the other one was a larger, um, you know, high threshold unit. And they found that as tension in the stretch increase, the recruitment of the larger motor unit was activated, as you can show here. So A here represents the smaller motor unit, right, you see here, and then as the stretch reflex or the, the tension and stretch increase, you could see the activation or the recruitment of the larger motor unit, and then here you can see superimposed together. Um, that was later followed by Milner et al., where they looked at the same, or they try to activate or um, reproduce this experiment in humans, and what they found was that at lower thresholds or at lower force demands, the slower oxidative uh, motor units, or the, these are 
motor units that have slow oxidated muscle fibers. Those are recruited first, followed by the, um, these are called fast oxidative glycotic fibers, so it's a combination of both um, anaerobic and aerobic base type of uh, muscle fibers, and so that makes up these FR units. These are the fast fatigue resistant units. Um, these are at the mid-level tension, and then the higher force demands, as I mentioned earlier, are the fast fatigable ones. These are anaerobic base ones, and they create a lot of tension, but they fatigue um, uh, faster here. So what Milner and all did, Milner Brown et al. did, is they did what's called a spike triggered averaging experiment, where they had a needle electrode here that's embedded in the dorsal interosseous muscle here in the thumb uh, that would trigger a force transducer here. So at low tension, that that force curve would have a lot of noise in it, and so if you have multiple, they had multiple traces. Of the you know of the the triggered forces here, and if we average all those traces, here is an average of 50 of those those um, uh, force traces. It would smooth it out, and so it would g give an indication of the force response of the muscle, and basically replicate that size principle, that, that orderly recruitment of motor units from slow to you know fast resistant or fat fatigue resistance and over to, to uh, the FF, the larger um, threshold motor units. So the force trace was detectable by averaging out the multiple traces here um, you know over time. So a very, you know, it's one of the landmark uh, experiments and studies that we still use today, and it gave us the first evidence into the orderly recruitment of uh, these motor units. So that leads us into fatigue, muscular fatigue, and w we know that um, the higher the demands, this is percentage of maximum vol voluntary contraction, that the endurance of a muscle fiber goes down. Like there's only so much time that a muscle can sustain a, a particular tension as that tension demands increases. So contraction time is inversely related to the tension or the target force. And I'm not going to go over into the details as the potential mechanisms by which muscular fatigue occurs. There's uh, you know, a lot of evidence in the research that suggests that it may be at the central nervous uh, level or the peripheral nervous system. I'll talk about that a little bit here in a sec. Or at the NMJ or the muscle fibers. Uh, what we do know overall is that um, about 15% or under 15% of MVC muscle voluntary contraction that uh, a muscle fiber can hold that particular tension indefinitely or so roughly 50% so it has good muscular endurance when that percentage of MVC is just under 15% so one theory behind muscular fatigue is what's called the onion skin scheme. And the idea is that um, at, at a particular MVC, at a particular force demand, as the impulses are coming into the muscle, the muscles can no longer keep up with that. And so the higher threshold motor units, these are the FR and FF units, will tend to fire at lower firing rate in order to kind of hold or sustain that particular muscle tension, whereas the lower threshold uh, motor units would fire at higher firing rates. And so what you have here is a cascade of multiple motor units firing at different firing rates and resembles the layers of an onion skin. And so that is one mechanism by which fatigue can occur or a response to fatigue in order for the muscle to attempt to withhold a particular tension. Um, so this is pretty interesting here. To, I, I'd always like to show this particular graph. You might have seen if you're familiar with uh, physiological research or histological research related to muscle contraction. So this is just a, a cascading of firing rates for multiple motor units which could exist in a particular muscles. Okay, so let's briefly discuss the muscular contraction. Again, so if you had anatomy and physiology, a lot of this will be a uh, review for you. So if we uh, take a muscle and, and zoom in through the myofiber and myofibrils and into the sarcomere itself. The sarcomere um, includes the thin filaments, which are made of actin uh, molecules, and thick filaments, which are made of myosin. And the overlaps between the two, 
um, is essentially provide the what's called the cross bridge theory behind a muscle contraction. So we're going to focus on the sarcomere, which is the functional unit of force generation of a muscle. So our sarcomere is defined from Z disc to Z disc of the same uh, myofibril or muscle unit here. It's made of the thick uh, filaments, which are, as I mentioned, these are the, the myosin uh, molecules that actually form the cross bridges themselves and the thin filaments which are made out of actin. So the cross bridge theory of a contraction is as a muscle is depolarized from an action potential from the um, peripheral nervous system and essentially uh, kickstarts the contraction here whereby the cross bridge of the myosin disassociates with the actin filament. This is the actin filament right here um, that's you know that's governed by this ATP. That's the energy that provides it. So it releases or disassociates that cross bridge so that it can then reattach itself to another part of the actin molecule shown here. Uh, ADP is then hydrolysized and uh, inorganic phosphate is also uh, released and that causes that power stroke. That is that stroke that is in the, the that forms the functional unit of force generation here. So this is a cool animated GIF that shows the cross bridge of a myosin as it dissociates from actin. Um, that is governed by that action potential and release of calcium and, and, and tropomyosin and then it allows the cross bridge from the myosin to disassociate from actin and then go to another part or reattach itself to another part of the actin and cause that power stroke here. Now it's important to note that the force generated by a sarcomere depends on both the, contra the contraction velocity of the muscle as well as the length of the sarcomere and to a certain extent the length of the muscle. So I show you here uh, a graph, it's otherwise known as a length tension curve. It's a classic curve that describes the relationship in muscle architecture between length and tension and there are two curves here. One is passive denoted by this dotted line and the other one is the active part when the muscle is uh, stimulated to, to contract. So I'm, I'm going to come back to this in a second and just briefly describe what this passive length tension relationship in a muscle. So if we consider the, keep in mind again this is single muscle fibers extracted from uh, frog muscles. This is from experiments back in the 50s and 60s by S uh, Sir Andrew Huxley and, and Gordon and Edmund. These are classic papers or classic studies that provide the information and knowledge that we know about muscular architecture today. And what they found is that if you were to stretch the muscle beyond its natural length, it would produce a tension that exponentially increases with length and because there's no contractile elements that are active during that time that passive tension comes from the architecture itself and specifically what they found was this uh, this protein known as titan which is embedded in series with the myosin and actin uh, cross bridges and that is the the natural passive tension of a particular muscle now, if we look at the active element, this is when the muscle is contracting. And I know it's conventional to typically interpret these graphs from left to right, but I'm actually going to look at it from, from the other way around, from right to left. And we're going to start with what's known as the descending limb. This is when the sarcomere length is um, at its longest, when it's being stretched out from beyond its optimal length. In this case, this was 2.2 microns. At the descending limbs, you'll see here, I'm going to zoom in, these are illustration of the actin and myosin um, uh, overlap. And when it's stretched out, like say between 2.2 and roughly 3.6 microns, at least according to this experiment, there's not a whole lot of overlap between the actin and between the actin filaments as well as the myosin cross bridges. So there's no force production. But as you decrease the length, the number of cross bridge overlap begins to increase and subsequently the ability to generate force increases and you can see here uh, it goes up to this point which is called the plateau where the sarcomere is now at its optimal length to generate 100% of its potential tension or potential force. We call that P-naught. 
that's the optimal length at which it can pr the, produce the highest force. Then we go into what's called the ascending limb. There are actually two parts of the ascending limb. This one's called the shallow part, and the other one's called the seat part. And, and then the shallow part represents areas within the muscle architecture, specifically between the, the myosin and actin cross bridges, where the actin these are the thin filaments right here. Um, they overlap. They double overlap, literally. And so the action of the the actin, and one of the actin that's overlapping, the other actin that's next to the myosin would interfere with the cross bridge um, um, interact contraction cycle that I showed you earlier, and thereby decreasing the amount of force that it can generate. As the the length of the sarcomere shortens that close to you know 1.2 1.3 microns now the myosin themselves begin to butt up against the zetas and also the generation of force thereby decreases so how does a muscle transmit that force ultimately to the joint well it does that through the muscular tendon complex so again if you had a and p uh, this should be a review for you so the muscle the the contractile part is the muscles themselves that's the force generation part or capacity of the muscle and it transmit to the tendon which are essentially passive you know they don't create any type of contraction these their job the tendon's job is to transmit the muscle the force generated by the muscle to the attachment of the bone, right? Whatever is the, the insertion points are. So muscles can only pull. They can only bring two insertion points together. I think many of you know that they do not push. And so it's capable to act as a motor or brake or spring or strut depending on the, the force demands and the human movement that is being uh, performed. So take, for example, the gastroc, uh, these are the triceps muscles, gastroc and soleus muscle, it contracts, it transmits its muscular force to the Achilles or the uh, Achilles tendon here that inserts on the posterior side of the calcaneus and thereby creating a plantar flexor torque as you see here. Right, and that's also governed by the moment. I'm going to talk about a, a little bit about the moment potential um, by a particular muscle through its moment arm. Uh, Mainly, there are three types of action. I know I, know I only list two here, but the uh, the three types of action of a muscle is concentric and eccentric, as well as isometric action. And concentric action is when the muscular generates greater force than the external force, and thereby the displacement is on the same it's in the same direction as the force generation itself. And we consider this action to the, the muscle tendon action to create work. Right, create energy. We call that positive work because it is generating and increasing the energy of the segment. Eccentric action is when the muscular force is less than the external force of the man. So you can see this when landing from a jump or in the early uh, uh, stance phase for both walking and, and running. In this case, the displacement is in the direction opposite to force generation, right? So it's, if a, a knee is flexing and the muscle, the, the, the quadriceps are firing or contracting, right? It's lengthening, but it's still generating force that is less than the external force. So we call that eccentric action that equates to what's called energy absorption. The muscle tendon complex is doing negative work, so therefore is decreasing the energy of the skeleton, is absorbing energy away from the, the segment itself. So that's power absorption. So that's shock absorption in the sec. Right? So again here I show here the kind of the, the mechanics involved with uh, a concentric, eccentric, and isometric contraction. So this first one here because here, this is the force created by the muscle tendon complex. This is essentially a free body diagram. And this is the external force. So again, when the force at the muscle tendon complex is greater than the force of uh, the external force themselves, and the displacement is in the same direction, what kind of contraction is that? Right, it's concentric contraction, right? The muscle is shortening, and then thereby creating the joint motion in the same direction in which that muscle is, um, you know, expands that particular joint. Uh, on the other hand, when the force is less than, the, I'm sorry, the muscle tendon force is less than the external force, and the displacement is in the direction opposite the direction of the muscle force contraction, what type of contraction is that? 
correct. That's eccentric contraction. Like um, I mentioned earlier about uh, the early stance phase, and you know we talk about the knee, but also at the ankle. You know, at the ankle. Um, if we talk about you know walking and a person heel strike that goes a, into what's called the heel rocker, that's a plantar, that passive plantar flexion. What controls that plantar flexion? What muscles um, eccentrically contract in order to control plantar flexion in a, a heel strike? Correct. Your dorsiflexors, right? The tibialis anterior, your um, EHLs and EDLs all fire eccentrically in order to slow down plantar flexion in this case. Now, this one's easy. This bottom one in which the force created by the muscular uh, tendon complex equals the external force and therefore there is no displacement. What do we call that? Correct. That's an isometric contraction because there's no displacement, there's no work, um, and so therefore there's no positive or negative uh, energy absorption in this case. So a couple of unique aspects of the muscle tendon complex, and one is referred to the stretch shortening cycle. And this um, aspect or this characteristic of the MTC refers to the ability of that complex to absorb energy in the eccentric phase of a movement. Let's just say we're talking about a squat jump and the person is, squ is squatting down. We know that is eccentric uh, action of say the knee extensors. And so the MTC absorbs energy that is ultimately released in the concentric phase. So it, it's that stretch shortening cycle. It stretches in the eccentric phase and then shortens as it goes concentric phase that aids in that um, movement. So if we're talking about a squat jump and a person is trying to jump as high as possible due to a strip extension, the SSC, the stretch shortening cycle, is activated to, uh, to I guess, materialize or to facilitate that energy absorption followed by energy generation. Now during an isometric action, the empty uh, muscle tendon complex develops a force that is equal to the external force on that joint, thereby not accelerating that joint. It's just a, it's an isometric hold, so there's no positive or negative work that's occurring at the MTC. So how does a muscle function overall after they've generated the force, transmit that force uh, over to the insertion point of the involved um, bone segment and spans a certain joint? So it creates a torque uh, about that joint, either in flexion or extension or plantar flexion or dorsiflexion or rotation, depending on where that tendon is, that MTC is, and that's dependent on both the magnitude of the force as well as the what's called the moment arm. So we're going to talk in a, a few slides here, the, the line of action of a muscle, how the force generation is dependent on the size, as I mentioned earlier, as in the architecture and activation patterns. So these are the determinants of joint strength and motion. And if we follow the line of action, those of you who are you're comfortable with your anatomy, your musculoskeletal anatomy, you'll know what a muscle, the action that a muscle creates about a specific joint. Say you're talking about a hamstring or you're talking about a, a rectus femoris. So if you follow the origin insertion and note where the muscle tendon complex um, is in relation to that joint's axis of rotation, rotation, you have a good understanding of the torque that it creates about that specific joint. So the force generation axis of a muscle is through that MTC, through that muscle tendon complex. And um, in a minute here, I'm going to talk about you know, the muscle fibers that are pinnated within the muscle, but the line of action of a particular muscle is through the, from the origin to the insertion point of that particular muscle. And depending, as I mentioned earlier, how far away that line of action is from the axis of rotation of the joint will determine the moment arm or the lever arm. Those are two synonyms that describe the same thing. And ultimately, the turning effect of the muscular force, what we call the torque. So you might have heard that as joint torque or joint moment. So joint moment is the product of the muscular force and the moment arm. So every muscle in the body has different moment arms with respect to the joints about which they span.
Let's take the knee for example. These are moment arms, or estimated moment arms for the knee flexors as shown here in this uh, kind of turquoise color. Um, actually no, that's more maroon color. And the turquoise color here are, represent the, uh, the quadriceps, right? These are knee extensors. So you can see here that the moment are slightly vary by the muscles themselves, where for example the bicep femoris, the short head and the long head, as a knee flexor represent the, the ones with the largest moment arm, so therefore it has the largest capacity to generate a flexor torque about the knee. Uh, conversely, on the other side, the rectus femoris has been shown to have the largest uh, moment arm, although there's not a whole lot of uh, difference in terms of moment arm because they obviously share the same tendon as it goes over the patella and then inserts in the tubular tuberosity. Um, but this is this illustration gives you a, a, a great appreciation on how these muscles move, for example, a joint like the knee through these moment arms. So it's force generation capacity of the muscles themselves, of course, but also the moment arm, where they're at uh, with respect to a joint's axis of rotation. And it turns out that those moment arms also vary by the angle in which that specific joint is. So again, we would take the uh, the knee here, and this is the knee flexion angle during gait, and the moment arm will vary between, in this case, five to 10 centimeters, depending where it's at in the range of motion. And as I mentioned earlier, when I talked about the, uh, the length tension relationship, the force generation force generation capacity of those muscles will also depend on the flexion angle of that specific joint. So if we go back to the architecture and muscle, and, this, and I talked a lot about the soccer mirror and the length tension relationship and force uh, velocity relationship, but overall, how do all of these individual muscle fibers co contribute to the muscles of force generation itself. So if we take a muscle that has fibers that are parallel to the muscle's line of action, that means that the muscle fibers will contribute close to 100% of its force generation capacity to the overall muscle force uh, generation capacity itself. Whereas if these mus same muscle fibers, not same muscle fibers, but if the muscle fibers of a different muscles um, are uh, at an angle, we call that pinnation. If they're pinnated like this, then the force generation capacity of those muscle fibers will only contribute a certain percentage of that that is largely dependent on the angle of pinnation. But um, just give you an example here. This is a sartorius muscle. It has fibers that are close to parallel, if not completely parallel to the muscle itself. And so therefore, almost 100% of the fiber length is you know, parallel to the muscle itself. And so the fibers themselves can contribute close to 100% of its force generation capacity to the sartorius muscle. Take the soleus on the other hand. It has a large pinnation angle. So therefore, each individual fibers can um, contribute a certain percentage that is largely based on the cosine of that pinnation angle to the overall force generation capacity of that muscle. And the way that we can measure the force generation capacity of a muscle, of an entire muscle, is using what's known as the physiological cross-sectional area, which is a function of both the muscle volume, the length of the muscle fibers, and the pinnation angle here. You see here, this is cosine theta. So this is theta, that's the pinnation angle. The cosine is the component of the muscle fibers um, force generation with respect to the muscle's line of action. So because it's just a fraction of the force generation capacity of the muscle fiber itself, it's only contribute a little bit. However, because at larger pinnation angles there's more space, the muscle can then fit, if you will, uh, more fibers into the muscles themselves, and therefore it has more sources. Even though it's just a fraction of the contribution, it has more fibers that can contribute to the overall um, muscle generation capacity, as shown here. So just a few of the muscles about the knee. You can see here, as I mentioned, the sartorius muscle, which is a long muscle. It has uh, muscle fibers that are close to parallel to the line of action, but it doesn't have a whole lot of fibers. 
as compared to, for example, the VLAT. So its physiological cross-section error is small, and subsequently its force generation capacity is small. Where something like the VLAS, and we see this a lot also in the gastroc, and the, the hamstring muscles, a couple of the hamstring muscles also have larger, relatively larger cross-sectional areas, and subsequently have a greater capacity to, to generate force. So just going to give you an idea of the dichotomy between fiber length and cross-sectional area, areas. Uh, long fibers tend to be faster muscles than, that have smaller cross-sectional areas, so they don't generate a whole lot of force. Look, this is muscle length. Look at the muscle force. As compared to shorter fibers, these are muscles like the muscles, you, uh, the fibers that you see in gastroc or the hamstring muscles that have larger physiological cross-sectional area and therefore are shorter fibers but can generate more force here. Um, take a look at the velocity, longer fibers here. Uh, as I mentioned, it generate you know, less uh, muscular force, but can contract at faster velocities. And to illustrate all this, this is from uh, Dr. Rick Lieber's book, his uh, pioneering book on skeletal muscle mechanics. Uh, you can see here that uh, increasing excursion, you've got muscles that can uh, generate or have smaller cross-sectional areas, have longer fiber lengths like the sartorius, like the gr uh, gracilis, the semitendinosus there. Over here, larger cross-sectional area like the medial gastroc, the VLAN as I showed you earlier, they have the, uh, an increasing amount of capacity to generate force but tend to be slower. So longer fibers, faster muscles, smaller force generation. Um, uh, larger cross-sectional area, these are ones with shorter fibers, tend to generate more force overall to the entire muscle. So anyway, that's just kind of give you an idea of the spectrum in muscular architecture that ultimately determines uh, muscle function. So again, let's take a look at the muscles around the knee. Uh, I have here uh, quadriceps and the plantar flexors. These are two muscles that have a uh, large pinnation ankle, so therefore are able to have more packed or more fibers that are packed within the muscles themselves. Uh, so large uh, cross-sectional area, slower velocity, but larger force generation. Uh, where some hamstrings and the dorsiflexors, such as the tibialis anterior, have smaller cross-sectional area, smaller pinnation angle, are faster, the larger excursion, but do not have the same amount of force generation capacity as the muscles that I showed you, the larger ones that I showed you here. So depending on the area within the muscle, these are just cross-sectional areas of a muscle, will determine where the fibers are, or the, the density of fibers within the muscles themselves. And the reason why I want to show you this particular slide is because size matters, yes, but so, so does location. And I'm going to talk about EMG electromyography here, and it's important to note not just anatomy, but to note muscle architecture on where the muscle fibers themselves for a particular muscle is typically concentrated. And um, you know, I'm gonna go over this here in a sec. So one of the ways that we could take a peek at what the muscle is doing, and really just took at the activation of a particular muscle, is what's using what's known as electromyography. There are two types, there's surface myography and you know, indwelling or needle or fine wire EMG. I'm going to focus mainly on surface EMG. Uh, so it's a way that we can study, mu study muscle function through the analysis of electrical activity. If you go back to my uh, description of the cross bridge um, contraction and how an action potential that uh, originates in the, you know, in this case the motor unit, so we're talking about the alpha motor neuron and the ventral root of the spine, goes to the NMJ and there's a re release of acetylcholine that starts this whole process of contraction. Well, there's electrical activity that's associated with that contraction and you've got multiple fibers within a muscle that is contracting to move a specific joint. We use surface EMG to 
to check those muscle activities, those electrical activities, amplify the signal, and we get something that looks like this. It looks like an analog, it is an analog signal, and what it is is a superimposition of individual motor unit action potentials. You've got multiple action potentials. In fact, that if we zoom in, this is the action potential for one motor unit. If you superimpose all of them, you get this EMG. You get this nice electromyography that tells us when a muscle is firing or not. So MUAP is the action potential of a motor unit. Again, that's the alpha motor neuron plus all the muscle fibers that it innervates. And so, you know, these are just a, a superimposition of all the MUAPs for particular muscles. Um, we use it a lot in gait. To determine which muscles are firing during the gait cycle. Um, so here's one example where it's EMG of the quadriceps. So we know that during early stance and terminal swing that these knee extensors are firing in order to either slow down a a flexing or I'm mean, sorry the, the, uh, the, the to assist in extending the knee into heel strike and slow down the flexing knee in early stance I showed you here uh, look at the bicep femoris same thing um, as well as the other hamstring muscles you can see when they're firing during the gait cycle so we use this EMG profile along with the kinematic and kinetic data to determine what's going on for a patient who may not be walking in, in a normal pattern, determine which muscles are affected because ultimately what we see are kinematics and you know the causes of the the, the uh, motion that we see is all partially provided by the kinetics, by the um, moments and, and forces. But the sources of forces, as I've been talking about this throughout this whole entire video, is because of these muscles. So it helps, EMG helps us to determine which muscles are firing, which ones are contributing to overall the, jo the joint during something like walking. So let's take the knee. This is a perfect example, one of the first kinematic graphs and, and joints that I studied when I was you know, working as an engineer in a gait analysis lab is the knee. So this knee flexion extension curve is a classic normal flexion extension throughout the gait cycle. And again, if we just take something like, let's take the gastroc. That's a good one. We know that gastroc is a plantar flexor. And let's take a look at what the knee is doing during this. Uh, this is the single leg stance right here, right? This is after the initial double support, the uh, contralateral leg comes off the ground. It, while it is swinging, this right here, this is knee flexion to extension here. You can see that the gastroc, which is a plantar flexor, it also is, it's a biotechnical muscle, but it's also a knee flexor. So as this knee is extending, this is firing in order to slow it down. And then ultimately it assists as we go into terminal swing and into toe off and to flexion. The, the knee thing, this is a little bit of a side, but the, the very interesting aspect of biarticular muscles is their ability to act as conduits for energy. Either while one joint is absorbing energy, it is also providing energy generation on the other joints, such as the rectus femoris, uh, the gastrocnemius I showed you here. Anyway, that's a bit of a side, and I talk about that in on mechanical energy in a separate video. Cool. Now, it's very important to know that although electromyography tells us a lot about muscle activation and when the muscles is on during a gait cycle, during running, during throwing, whatever movement activity, uh, it does not give us an accurate indication of force. Very important. And I'll give you an example here. Um, this I showed you this. This is the link tension curve, right? Uh, that I showed you earlier, and that just illustrates that the the tension and subsequently the force generated by the muscle depends on soccer mirror length and depends on the overall position and length of the, uh, the particular muscle. But it's also dependent on velocity. So this is the force velocity curve. I didn't show you this until now. This is P naught or L naught as just shown here. This is the isometric length, and as velocity increases. Remember I said excursion velocity. Look at the muscle force. It decreases. In fact, it, the largest muscle force that it can generate is when it's at zero. So we call that the uh, my, uh, isometric uh, tension here. This is the maximum force that it can generate when it's at zero contractile velocity. But when as the velocity increases, the muscular force that it can generate 
also decreases. Very important because at certain percentages of muscle velocity, for example, either 5% or 1%, we're close to maximum muscular forces, but the signal, the EMG signal, will be identical. So when you're interpreting these EMG, it's very important to note that you restrict your analysis to simply activation. Don't try to make any inferences as to the force that it can actually generate. It may give you some indication, but you need other um, data to in order to determine the, the force that a particular muscle has on a joint, whether joint reaction force, you know, there's a, you know, a dynamometers and force transducers that are used in conjunction with EMG to give you a full picture of the force and torque that's generated by that muscle.